fast to my heart and fall to do this college also in Bannon. It's this lecture not play Steve Wright. Uh, very warm welcome to you all to University College Isle of Man for this evening's lecture. Um, our speaker this evening, I'm very pleased to say, is a former student of UCM. Steve graduated in 2017 with a first class degree in History, Heritage Management and Mag Studies. Now, in addition to his day job, Steve runs a very successful tour guiding company, Isle of Man Guided Tours, with a speciality in wildlife tours. And I don't know how he finds the time, but he is also in the process of finishing off a book a travel log about his wildlife adventures in Britain. So that will definitely be one to look out for when it's published. This evening, however, um, Steve is going to speak to us about a piece of research that he undertook for his final year dissertation. He's going to be talking to us about a piece of research that he undertook for his final year dissertation, looking at the past, present and future of the Manx Constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for appearing tonight. I was surprised that so many people will want to know about politics during Brexit. Uh, this talk is about Manx politics and is based on my dissertation. And the purpose of the dissertation was to analyse the constitutional reform movements which created a democratically elected House of Keys and the current membership of the Legislative Council. And to save me saying legislative and slurring through it, I'm going to refer to it as LegCo throughout. At the end of the talk, I will apply the historical evidence uh, to some potential future reform ideas and discuss whether any have any likelihood of success. Uh, first slide, just kind of give a brief overview of the Max political structure. So Timwald is the name of the House of Keys and the Legislative Council, LegCo, when they're combined. And currently the House of Keys has 24 MHKs, LegCo a president, eight MLCs, members of the Legislative Council, a bishop who has a vote, and an attorney general who doesn't. So first of all, I'm going to begin with the reforms of the House of Keys, and then I'm going to do two stages of reforms to LegCo, and then finally discuss uh, the Liz Fain report. So first of all, we begin in 1765, where uh, revestment and that was when the island was purchased by the British crown. The British monarch became the Lord of Man and entrusted the island's executive powers to an appointed governor and his council, which would become LegCo. This made them the most powerful political force on the Isle of Man at that time. The constitutional reform campaigns of the mid-19th century focused on demands for greater democratic representation. In 1822, the governor criticised the self-chosen MHKs as no more representative of the people of man than of the people of Peru. This is because the House of Keys at the time were self-appointed, not publicly elected. Prior to 1867, when there was a vacancy for a new MHK, the House of Keys chose two candidates and submitted both names to the governor, and he would pick one. The MHKs wanted to retain this power to select their own representatives, but there was opposition from the Manx public, particularly new residents in Douglas, who felt excluded and unrepresented. There were petitions for reform, but these were met with counter-arguments from the Governor and the British Home Secretary, who favoured annexation of the island into Britain and the abolition of Timwald. But the Manx people strongly opposed attempts to remove their independence. Members of the public voiced their opinions in the local newspapers, and in 1833, one writer warned the House of Keys if it did reform did not reform itself from within, it would be reformed with a vengeance from without. 
Some of the most notable agitators for reform were newspaper as editors. Robert Farger of the Mona's Herald in the 1830s to 50s, and James Brown of the Isle of Man Times in the 1860s. Editorials raised questions regarding taxation without representation and criticised Timwald for being judge, jury and prosecutor against people who opposed their rule. Brown's editorials landed him in jail for contempt and breach of House of Keys privileges and he was sentenced to jail by 21 MHKs. But this was subsequently overturned by the British Lord Chief Justice. And this event demonstrates the strength of British rule over Timwald during the 19th century, as they could overturn decisions made by the House of Keys. There were calls for investment in the local infrastructure, particularly Douglas Harbour. However, the max revenue surplus was withheld by the British government due to the unrepresentative status of the House of Keys. In 1863, Governor Locke was appointed, and unlike his cautious predecessors, he energetically pursued diplomatic solutions to remedy the island's problems. He brokered a deal for new legislation which resulted in Timwald's treasury acquiring more of the surplus revenue on the condition that the MHKs be publicly elected. The MHKs finally agreed to link relinquish their powers to choose their own members in 1867. This was not because of public pressure, but because of the promise of greater control of Manx finances. But the MHKs realised afterwards that their powers were still limited. The governor and LegCo still had the ability to block legislation as any new laws would have to go through a LegCo vote before being made law. This ability to block was called the veto, and it is important during later reform periods. The MHKs did gain power, however, through the legitimacy of being democratic, and they would use this as leverage for the next stage of reforms, which relate to the composition of LegCo. So that's the MHKs. Now we're going to move over to LegCo, and that's... At the time, in 1791, governor's most important member. And we've got the bishop and the attorney general there. And they're still here, members. But we also had lots of other different members. And these titles relate to their roles outside of LegCo. So first vicar general, vicar general, receiver general. We've got the deemsters there on the clock. The roles, roles which still continue outside LegCo now. There's an archdeacon and... Uh, other clerical positions, a water bailiff and a comptroller, and they were both tax collectors. Or So, before 1885, the ones in red, they lost their positions. And then, in 1885 itself, the water bailiff went from LegCo, leaving those members. In 1903, MHK elections produced a majority of members who pledged to transfer powers from LegCo. Samuel Norris, a journalist, reformer and uh, future MHK, claimed that 23 of the 24 new MHKs supported policies set out by his Manx National Reform League. This campaigned for two-thirds of LegCo to be publicly elected and this includes the removal of the Vicar General, Receiver General and a Deemster. In 1866, we had Governor Locke, who was progressive, but in 1903, there was Governor Raglan, and he was resistant to change. He liked the status quo. In 1905, MHKs urged the Governor to make reforms, and this was without success, so they contacted the Home Office in 1906. The clerk of the rolls said that the reforms should be debated in Timwall first rather than going to the Home Office. And he said, instead of running off to their grandmother in London and saying we are not dealing fairly with them, 
as it was making ourselves ridiculous. But the House of Keys wanted to do this because if they passed, tried to pass the laws through Timwald, the ledge code could block it with their veto immediately. So they thought they might have more chance if they involved the Home Office. The House of Keys petitioned for the removal of positions and they argued that the MLC should be a minority with, within LegCo with the majority of MLCs directly elected by the people. So the petition specified that they should be elected rather than selected by MHKs. And this demonstrated a willingness in 1908 for the public to d directly decide the membership. In November 1910, an exasperated uh, MHK, Mr. William Crennell, highlighted that no progress had been made after seven years' of debate. He claimed that those opposing reform had been guilty of carping criticism, of innuendo, of sneering, but that no compelling arguments had been raised against their proposals. So it's not a particularly friendly banter between the two chambers. The MHK case could threaten strike action, but they had little other leverage against the LegCo blocking their demands. In April 1911, Home Secretary Winston Churchill sent a deputation led by Lord Macdonald to the Isle of Man to begin an inquiry. The committee gathered evidence and their findings were presented in August. They proposed a 10-member LegCo, the Bishop, Attorney General, two judges and two appointees by the Governor, with the remained, remaining four chosen by the House of Keys. The inquiry confirmed that LegCo was still the power base of Timwald and financial bills should continue to originate from that chamber. However, they acknowledged the balance of power could change in the future. The report did not include any recommendations for publicly elected MLCs which removed this option from much of the ensuing debate. However, the report did include elements not in the House of Keys petition, and they focused on poor relief and old age pensions. The, in 1912, the Home Office confirmed that all of their proposals should be carried together and rather than individually. In 1913, the recommendations were delivered to the House of Keys and they started to make amendments. They supported the constitu constitutional reforms elements of the, the report, but not those relating to social reforms and financial matters. And they also debated whether MLCs should be elected by the people. And this proposal was defeated by 11 votes to 3. 13, sorry. 11 to 13. And that point in time was the closest we have ever come to having publicly elected MLCs. In 1914, LegCo read the House of Keys version of the Constitutional Bill and the discussion began negatively when the Attorney General called for its rejection on the basis that it had been amended. He attacked the House of Keys for not making any effort to discuss the report when they met in Timwald and uh, this was an uh, approach that William Crennell, NMHK, uh, rejected due to the discursive way in which discussions are carried. The clerk of the rolls, who was a member of LegCo, accused the MHKs of a political dodge, and the Receiver General, who was in LegCo but supported reform, said they mustn't reject the bill because it would raise the most serious crisis in constitutional matters the island has ever known, but LegCo rejected the bill. MHKs wanted to discuss their concerns, but the MLCs argued that the bill had been rejected and the debate was finished. MHKs contacted the Home Secretary to inter intervene again, and they also threatened to go on strike, which was avoided narrowly in a vote 11 to 12. The Home Secretary then rescinded the earlier request for all proposals to be included in the bill and supported the House of Keys decision to focus on constitutional reform. However, 
A significant event on the 4th of August 1914 provided a reason for reforms to be postponed at the start of World War I. The actions of the Governor and LegCo throughout the period indicated they considered reform unimportant, but they could only delay and not extinguish calls for reforms. The most notable public campaigner of this period was Samuel Norris. His petitions failed to achieve a direct response, but he was successfully elected as an MHK later. Another important campaigner, Alfred Tia, also became an MHK in 1919, and this emphasises the importance for campaigners to be inside Timwald rather than trying to influence change from outside. During the House of Keys debate in 1915, Mr. Quartrow proposed that the island become part of Lancashire. And this was voted down by all of the members except the proposer himself. <laughs> this display of overwhelming opposition provided a strong straw man argument against annexation being taken seriously in the future. Some commentators have also thought that this might have been a deliberate thing to make sure that it fails significantly so that it's wiped off the table forever. And this also shows that both the House of Keys and LegCo have veto powers. In 1917, the clerk of the rolls uh, passed away and left a vacancy. But instead of filling the position, the roll was merged with the first steamster. This was against the wishes of Governor Raglan, but supported by the Home Office. And the Governor agreed in obedience to their command. This demonstrates that the Governor remained under the control of the Crown and he could not independently dictate the island's legislature. In July 1918, Governor Raglan announced the end of, of bread subsidies and due to the public's ongoing, ongoing discontent with the war and food shortages, his announcement started a general strike known as the bread strike and there were civil demonstrations. Under enormous pressure, Governor Raglan reinstated the bread subsidy and his tempestuous period in office ended when he resigned in December 1918. This ensured he would never succumb to enacting further constitutional reform and this issue was inherited by his successor. With the resignation of Raglan and the end of war, the House of Keys resumed its reform demands in January 1919. The <coughs> MHKs blamed the bread strike on the upper chamber and insisted that Raglan's replacement should be someone who would facilitate reform. The appointment of Major General Fry provided the House of Keys with somebody more sympathetic to, to their demands. The Clerk of the Rolls position had already been vacated and in 1919, the Alaman Constitutional Act removed the Vicar General, the Archdeacon and the Receiver General from LegCo. And their places were, were filled by four appointees chosen by the House of Keys. So there's the four disappearing. We've got two appointees chosen by the Governor, new ones, and then four chosen by the MHKs. The delays throughout Raglan's period did not cause the reform movement to lose momentum. Ultimately, the publicly elected House Keys, with support from the Home Office, had sufficient powers to pass reforms. The bread strike was a key event in the removal of Governor Raglan, but not directly for reform. Raglan's replacement aided the constitutional reform movement, and LegCo bowed to his authority. The reforms were a result of MHKs doggedly keeping reform on the agenda, and they had significant motivation. An increase in democratic representation could be well received by their constituents, 
and increase their chances of re-election. Also, a power transfer from LegCo strengthened the MHK's chances of progressing their own issues. The third se section of reforms happened from the 1950s. And this was to try and increase elected members at the ex expense of appointed MLCs. The uh, House of Keys had selected four of the ten MLCs from 1919, and they probably expected those members to kind of support them when they put forward laws. Uh, however, they didn't. And uh, that, that this prompted some unveiled threats that some MLCs might not be re-elected. One of them claimed this was blackmail. In 1957, during a period of economic slow slowdown, reform debates were instigated by Clifford Irving MHK. He wanted powers transferred from Crown appointees, and he also wanted the votes of both chambers to be combined in Timwald, which would prevent one chamber vetoing the other's wishes. Irving proposed in November 1957 that a new commission be created. A Home Office inquiry was formed in 1958, and this was led by Lord McDermott. The recommendations from the inquiry were discussed in Timwald rather than the House of Keys, and this shows greater cooperation between the chambers than during the previous periods. The McDermott report proposed that the governor should be replaced by the first deemster as chair of LegCo, which would contain a bishop, attorney general, five MLCs elected by the House of Keys and three by the governor. The governor's powers from 1958 were gradually devolved into executive councils and the board systems, and his influence was less significant than earlier. But the British Home Office could still retain some influence over Timwald through their appointed MLCs. The report recommended that LegCo's powers of veto should be replaced by delaying powers. And in 1960, the resolution was debated in Timwald. The speaker emphasised the importance of the removal of the veto. And... An amendment to adopt all MacDonald report recommendations was voted favourably by the MHKs 19 to 1, but LegCo used its veto, voted 1 to 8 against, and the report was unable to pass. The Attorney General proposed an amendment to retain the second deemster, and LegCo voted 7 to 2 in favour. The House of Keys voted 1 to 18 against. They then voted on the removal of the LegCo veto. House of Keys, 18 to 2. Rejected by LegCo, 3 to 6. And this generated a shout of shame by Mr. Krush, MHK. In December 1960... The MHK has created a new bill closer to the original McDermott report. Legislation moved to LegCo. It met objections. They didn't want the second deems to, to go as an MLC. And they just deleted it from the bill. The clauses removing the veto were also amended. And LegCo only agreed to replace it with a joint Timor vote, which would require two-thirds majority for legislation to pass. The next House of Keys meeting showed strong objections to the LegCo amendments. MHKs argued they should contact the Home Office or go on strike again. But eventually they decided to send a committee to meet with LegCo. Now, this meeting was never documented. But the House of Keys deputation reported back in October 1916 that negotiations had been successful. The veto would be replaced with powers of delay. Five MLCs would be elected by the MHKs, but as a compromise, the second deemster would remain. 
LegCo could not block reform demands indefinitely, but for the time being, they had protected their own positions. However, with the successful removal of the veto, the MHKs now had powers to replace any appointed MLCs in the future. The capitulation of LegCo indicates their inability to completely thwart the wishes of an elected chamber following guidance from a Home Office inquiry, which repeats the circumstances of the reforms in 1919. The bill became the 1961 Alaman Constitution Act, crucially removed the veto from LegCo, plus an additional MLC was elected by the House of Keys down there in the bottom. LegCo could still delay bills for two years, but afterwards a majority vote of 17 MHKs could now force through legislation against their wishes. With these new powers secured, the House of Keys met in 1963 and resumed their ambitions to remove the second deemster from LegCo. LegCo rejected this four to seven. The rejection was discussed by the House of Keys and they reiterated their proposal with a vote of 18 to 1. In March 1965, the Attorney General stated that he would prefer the bill to become law through LegCo vote rather than by using their powers of delay. And the motion was carried 5 to 3. This resulted in the second deemster losing his position in 1965. There goes the second deemster. The capitulation of LegCo resistance in the build-up to the 1965 Act demonstrated that their powers were now significantly weakened and they could no longer defend themselves against House of Keys proposals. In January 1969, the House of Keys proposed that their governor's appointees should be replaced by two elected by the House of Keys. The following year, 1971, uh, this removed the Attorney General's vote in Timwald. The next appointed member to be targeted was the first Deemster, and this raised a debate to create a new position, a president. A president was considered necessary if there was no longer a governor or his deputy, the first Deemster, to chair LegCo. The proposal for the first deemster to be removed from LegCo, but continue in his judicial capacity, was voted by the House of Keys 17 to 2. The first deemster seems to be ceased to be a LegCo member after 1975, which left only the governor, the bishop, and the attorney general as appointed members. In 1977, the House of Keys created a bill to reduce powers of delay to one year, which would match the House of Lords, and this was passed in 1978. The 1959 McDermott Report and the UK's 1973 Kilbraden Report recommended the removal of the Governor from LegCo. This was enacted in 1980, when the Governor was replaced as Timwell Chair by one of the MLCs. This act removed the governor's remaining powers and the formerly most powerful member of Timwald was reduced to a ceremonial position. The change significantly reduced Crown influence over Timwald and provided greater independence for the Manx government. There's the governor. Timwald's first president was elected to chair LegCo in 1990 and this was to be the last major amendment to LegCo membership. The removal of the LegCo veto was crucial, and once achieved, the House of Keys could gradually remodel LegCo membership without obstruction. To achieve reform, MHKs such as William Crennell in the 1910s and Clifford Irving from the 1950s needed to drive the process. The main public contribution was not through external campaigns or protests, 
but to elect MHKs who facilitated change. The events of the period did little to increase public representation. Instead, it was mostly a power transfer from the Legislative Council to the House of Keys. <coughs> Former MHKs were elected into LegCo to replace appointed members, and these new MLCs remained under some House of Keys control, as their re-election depended on votes from their old chamber. So that concludes the historical evidence, and now we're going to look at Liz Vane's reports and the future. So, President. Okay, the Liz Vane report of 2016. This was after an amendment was carried in Timwall in 2015 for a review of Manx government functions. Some motivation was provided by Chief Minister Alan Bell, who stated he was exasperated by the continued discussions about LegCo reform, which created random debates and bills which led nowhere. The historical evidence since 1990 supports this statement. In April 2016, an inquiry was started by Lord Lisbane, an experienced member of the House of Lords, and he provided several proposals, including some on constitutional reform. I'm going to discuss these four in particular. The first, unicamer unicameralism, so that's just one chamber. Uh, the current MHK manifestos well, for the last election uh, have not shown any desire to abolish LegCo. Liz Fain also saw the importance of this chamber's scrutiny and revising function. If LegCo was abolished, MHKs would have to become responsible for those roles and none of them have really campaigned strongly for extra accountability. In 2012, Mr. Gorn MHK pr proposed that LegCo be abolished, and this failed in the House of Keys even before a LegCo vote. Politicians have not historically supported calls for their own demise, and the abolishment of LegCo is unlikely to achieve a majority vote. The second one, the bishop. There are currently two appointed members, the bishop and the attorney general. Although the Lisbon inquiry received some opposition to the bishop's membership and his vote, Lisbon and other commentators saw no compelling reason for change, as the bishop provides an independent voice and represents all faiths. The manifestos for the current MHKs showed little support for removing appointed members. <coughs> Therefore, currently, this is unlikely to change. Publicly elected MLCs. The biggest step towards greater democratic representation would be if the Manx people directly elected their MLCs. Since 1914, this subject has received a significant amount of debate time, with some recent examples in... 1994, 2000, 2007, 2015, and 2016. And these proposals have always failed at the vote. Only six manifestos during the last MHK elections supported a publicly elected LegCo, with only three of those candidates succeeding to be one of the 24 MHKs. So three out of 24 is a small minority within the House of Keys. There have been various arguments against public elections for MLCs. Uh, first one, if both chambers were elected, it will be difficult to distinguish between MHKs and MLCs. Eight publicly elected MLCs would have larger constitution, uh, constituencies than the 12 constituencies held by MHKs. Therefore, the MLCs, if they so wished, could claim a greater public mandate and threaten the supremacy of the House of Keys. Secondly, candidates with financial resources would have an advantage canvassing larger constituencies. Thirdly, MLCs would have 
constituency responsibilities if they re required public votes. And fourthly, MHKs believe they are in the best position to choose suitable MLC candidates as they vote for people with experience and scrutiny skills relevant to the role. So for successful reform, it requires a majority support in Timwald, and it is unlikely to happen if politicians feel they will have less power as a result. Fourthly, indirectly elected MLCs. Liz Vane suggested amending the current nomination process to encourage candidates from outside of uh, XMHKs. A remedy could be to have uh, restrictions so XMHKs wouldn't be able to uh, be candidates. But only one recent MHK uh, manifesto supported this idea. MHKs could argue that LegCo benefits from exterior experienced politicians. But it is important to note that since my dissertation and the Lisbane report, the latest elections of MLCs brought in four new members, none of which were ex-MHKs. So perhaps this approach will continue in the future. <clears throat> A nominations committee could receive criticism. It would contain unelected people, and they could possibly recommend candidates who have never even faced a public vote. Ultimately, an independent nominations committee would be less democratic than the existing process, as MHKs can argue that they are public representatives and they are selecting MLCs on behalf of their constituents. History shows politicians supported movements to remove powers from other chambers, but rejected proposals to remove their own. Therefore, the proposal for a nomination committee is unlikely to ever succeed. So, in conclusion, in 1919, Governor Fry said that by studying the history of reform, one has often found that all those ideas have been discussed and decided years ago on practically the same lines that they will be in the present. This is true of many of Lisbane's constitutional proposals. Previous periods of reform were given impetus by the Macdonnell and McDermott reports, but the UK now has less influence over Timwald. Lisbane's report is less binding and only acts as a series of recommendations which MHKs can support or dismiss. Before 1919, there was war and a global move for greater democracy, whilst in the late 1950s, the island was suffering an economic downturn. Since 1991, however, the Isle of Man has enjoyed a strong increase in GDP, a period which has seen no significant constitutional reforms. Potentially, a future recession might provide the fuel for public protests regarding government costs. Although no protests of significant scale has taken place since the bread strike in 1918. And that strike was not driven by constitutional reform, but for a basic public need, affordable food. It is highly unlikely that government cost-saving will include a reduction in political headcount. Timwald will always need sufficient political representation to function effectively as an independent jurisdiction. It would be inaccurate to compare the Isle of Man against a similar-sized UK town, for example Chester, which only has one Member of Parliament. In addition, it is unlikely that a majority of Manx people will ever change their objections against annexation. Historical commentators have highlighted the importance of self-interest for politicians, and MHKs such as Norris and Gorn have also raised the same issue. Whilst one MHK compared modern LegCo reforms as Turkey's voting for Christmas. 
Self-interest amongst any employee in any business sector cannot be quantified, but it has undoubtedly affected historical debates and this will continue into the future. The desire for a publicly elected LegCo has been considered throughout Tim Wald's recent political history and different permutations and ideas have been discussed during hundreds of hours of debate time without success. Consideration now needs to be given to drawing a line in the sand and conceding that public elected MLCs will never become a reality. Major reforms during Tim Wald's history have required the driving force of determined individuals such as Governor Locke and MHKs like William Crannell and Clifford Irving. Through all reform periods, it was only the major powers in Timwald who were capable of enacting reform. In 1867, Governor Locke was the most powerful person in Timwald and he achieved directly ele uh, elected MHKs. In 1919, Governor Fry, backed by the British Liberal Government, successfully put through constitutional reform. And since the 1950s, the House of Keys have been the most powerful force in Timwald, and they have been the one who have driven change. In each instance, the drivers of reform were also those who had the greatest powers. Based on all the evidence, the final summary is, any future reform movements will need reformers, and like before, the reformers would need to be political members of Timwald. Thank you. That was a, that was a real education. Thank you very much. I expect everybody in this room has learned something tonight. Um, and I have to congratulate you on your slides. <laughs> because I think that really helped to explain the changes that were taking place. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions, if anybody would like to ask anything. Steve, when you were considering your dissertation, yes. did you consider what, the new, what do I mean by constitutional? Because when I regard a constitution, I think of the American constitution, the Irish constitution, mm. where I can pick up a pamphlet and say, that's what my rights and responsibilities are. Yes. You didn't mention any of that. Uh, no, yes, it's uh, terminology, I guess. You were on a structural thing about... Yes, the, the competition. Yes, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Can, I, can I then ask, um, and, and I, I have a slight insight in here, and I, I know what sources Steve is going to ask, so this might be a little bit of an unfair question, but um, you touched now and again on the role of the Manx public in terms of the bread strike hmm. and electing reforming MHKs. I just wondered if you had any further thoughts on what the role of the Manx public was, um, or might be, in terms of bringing about... In the, in the future? Uh -huh. Well, and in the past. Well, in early 1900s, they was, uh, well, there were bigger fight, uh, fights to fight back mm -hmm. then. So in the 1860s, there was nobody, the public had very little say. It was all run by self-appointed MHKs and a ledge code that was appointed by the British Home Office. So they had no voice whatsoever in, in government. So, to achieve the reforms in, for the MHKs was big. Then to remove uh, British-appointed um, MLCs is big as well. What we've got now is we've achieved all of the big reforms, and it's probably just tweaking now. And I can't see, apart from the four which Liz Vane suggested, any other burning issues. So I, I can't see a lot happening, to be honest. So you can, you can imagine the public um, campaigning for specific reforms such as the abortion abortion Yes. Law, but not for constitutional reform. Yeah, yeah, you'll have big crowds about gas prices and yeah. things like that, but for reforms themselves, I don't think many people were banging the door about Liz Vane's report and saying, we must do this. So. Chris Roberts, your MHK said, I think the press this week, that MHKs are compliant 
in the House of Commons and to compliant with the government, for example. Um, and in Lord Lindsay's report, he identified that I think it was 87 percent of MHK were members or received the patronage of the Alabama government. Yeah. Now, I would say that's a pressing concern in a society. Um, it, it, like the Isle of Man model or the Westminster model of government with separation of powers. Um, would you say that reform cannot take place until the Council of Ministers Act is maybe amended and so that there is a, a greater separation of powers between the government and the education? Yeah, because what we have, although we always say our oh, MHKs are independent, they're not. Because Komen is a political party and they all tote their party line behind the chief minister. And then, I guess if you're not part of that, and very few aren't now, then there's very little voice outside of the council of ministers. But then how do you then affect change against the majority who hold the power? And, and I, I can't think of a solution to that. Yeah. But then, who, who's going to stand and say, I'm not going to be a part of Comin, and then get elected and then get offered well, a, a position? I can't speculate that a political party would come along and have a manifesto where they'd say, we're either going to be in government or we're going to be outside of government, and the vote for us on that principle. Yeah. So they give the electorate the option to say, well, these are principles on the basis of identification of the a problem with the separation of powers, we're going to vote for them and they yeah. vote for them into government or into opposition. Would do you say that Liberal Vanin have tried to achieve that? Uh, no. Because <laughs> 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 that, that's the one example I could think of. As I don't think they've said that in the manifesto. They, they haven't made a transparency about their intentions okay. to the electorate. That's what it needs. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I don't, sorry, I can't add. Jeff, um, I couldn't help noticing that in the House of Keys there are only two women. Yes. Whereas uh, in the Legislative Council, women are in the majority. Yes. I wonder if you saw any significance in that, or is it only that women are the best at the experience <laughs> and the scrutinising? <laughs> Certainly. Uh, uh, it was very, very new, the, uh, the new four appointees. Um, Prior to that, yeah, it was, it was only two before the last. So we're now up to six. Um, the voting public has to take some responsibility for who they, who they back at the ballot box. Um, hopefully it... I think it was a very good choice to have four female candidates brought through as MLCs in the last election. And it might be a starting point for, for more... There was problems. I, I, I remember some ex MHKs complaining that it was an old boys club and that it was difficult for female MHKs to be in the tumult environment. But hopefully, that's that's a thing of the past. I think it would be interested, interesting to look at the number of um, women who are putting themselves forward for election mm -hmm. as MHKs or, or in the Legislative Council and see whether. Whether that trend might be changing, but that's hmm. a piece of work that hasn't yet been done. Uh, maybe a future dissertation. Uh, maybe I'll be a future dissertation, <laughs> yes. Um, at the back there. Um, yeah. you, you talked about um, Turkey's voting for Christmas. Yes. At what point were um, MHK's salary and MLC's as well? I, I, my understanding is it was later in, in uh, the United Kingdom. Oof. I'm not quite sure on that one. Um, I, I, do, I, do. <laughs> uh, I found it difficult to track it down. I assume it became a, your expenses and then expenses plus yeah. and, and so on. Um, but I, the, I, the, I, I would say follow the money. Yes, <laughs> but, but there, there must be some, because these MRCs were fighting for their positions in the 1950s and they weren't going to give up. Uh, you would assume that because of that, there was some sort of financial incentive to retain that position, even though they've got another role, say, first Deemster. He's still a judge, but he's also a member of LegCo, so I do expect there to be something in there. Well, 
but I, d I don't know the answer. Okay. Okay. Prior to um, those fame reports, uh, the budget became under the crosswires of, uh, of uh, potential removal. Has it been um, discussed in prior reforms about the bishop being taken out of ledge code? Yeah. And has the public ever, ever been canvassed to, uh, to assess their mm -hmm. view? Because it seems like quite an anachronistic uh, uh, position, and then as we become more and more secular, it seems to be less and less important to have somebody of faith dictating uh, or having influence on. Yeah. But there was a very good paper done by Professor Edge about the bishop's influence in Timwald. And he looked at all of the voting history and saw where he'd actually sided or made a difference. And throughout, you might know that it was only like twice in the last 30 years. And they were on not particularly burning issues. So he's, I don't think his actual influence is that strong as a one vote within 32 um, and within Professor Edge's research he couldn't see it being changed that soon but I guess it's going to be something that will continually be raised and at the moment none of the MHKs who have got manifestos have been pushing for it as a kind of a political pledge do you have any idea why Lord Isveen didn't recommend removing the bishop? Do you think he's just a traditionalist? Or yeah. Did he have other? Did you think it would be too controversial? Or? I don't know. It may even be just personal belief that you know maybe to have this separate voice who isn't driven by. It's too much by politics might be um, have its position in the in the chamber, but uh, yeah, but at the moment I can't see that changing in the next ten, fifteen years. But then I guess opinions within society are changing, and I I think yes, it will then become more of a kind of a. a a talking point and people will start to think more strongly against it at the moment. I don't think it's, it isn't. That's my opinion. Isn't, isn't a large part of that question <coughs> that if the bishop doesn't stay in Timor, the role can bishop? Yes, there has been threats, isn't there, that uh, if he was to lose his position, then we would no longer have a bishop. Uh, one last question. Do we need to look more closely at the people who are appointed to carry out our inquiries? Um, Lord Lisbane's wife is a Church of England vicar. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. There might be some bias. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know why Lisbane himself was particularly... It, I think he'd, he'd done um, research on other jurisdictions... Uh, MLC well, side, so, right. yes, yeah. But I, I think he did look at the um, constitutions of other Commonwealth countries prior to the Isle of Man, so maybe that put him ahead. Uh, very quickly. Uh, you, you indicated that changes in uh, the structure of Tim Wood and Regco were dictated by specific events. Hmm. Do you think, or I, I certainly think, that representational democracy is being challenged at the moment by what's happening, particularly with Brexit, you start? Yes. <laughs> Do you think that because of that, that might change our attitudes to how Legco is formed? It's not a specific event, it's just a general movement within society and the, and the desire to have active involvement with politics by, by the public. Yeah, there were, I think a candidate stood in the last election saying that he wouldn't have any sort of mandate and his, his voting would be determined by the, the people who 
from his constituency contacts him and said, well, how do you think I'm going to vote on, how would you like me to vote on this? They tell him and then he places his vote based on that. So that, that's pretty, pretty <laughs> unique. He did not get voted in though, so we will never find out about that. But yeah, I, I think I, there's, there's two sides. I think there's, there's a lot of apathy. I mean, the, the, we're still not getting a huge turnout at the polling booths for MHK elections. Um, but then again, social media does allow that, uh, you know, the, we can be more informed if we want to be. But whether people will or not, I don't know. I think we could probably talk about this all night. Um, and I hope I'm right in saying that Steve will be happy to stay and have a chat with yeah, you. Yeah, sure. If anybody has any other questions. Um, but for the moment, I have a few announcements before we wrap it up. But can we just please thank our speaker again? For a very Next month's lecture will take place on Wednesday the 24th of April when another former UCM student, Chris Callow over here, will be talking to us about the history of intact farms on the Isle of Man and you can book your tickets for that on Eventbrite. The following week on Tuesday, Tuesday the 30th of April, back by popular demand, Professor Peter Edge from Oxford Brookes University and Professor Claire de Tan from the Legal Institute of Jersey will be here to discuss the relationship between Tinwald and the Isle of Man government, past, present and future. So if you want to continue the discussion, you can do so on the 30th of April. Ask him about the bishop as well. Oh, we'll make sure we ask him about the bishop, yeah. Um, if you'd like any information about University College Isle of Man, about studying here, about the evening classes that we run or anything like that, um, please come and have a word with me afterwards. Um, we've got a few flyers here for the History and Heritage degree, if you know anybody who might be interested. Um, and if you're interested to find out what other degree programmes we offer here, again, please just come and have a word with me. Um, we also offer an evening class in Manx History and Heritage. If you're interested in that, come and have a word. Um, and lastly, if you are not yet on our History and Heritage mailing list, but you would like to be kept informed of upcoming events, please do leave us your email address on your website. With that said, I will let you get home for your tea, have a safe journey, and I hope to see you next month. Eva. Mm -hmm.